All right, ladies, grab your favorite non-sweet treat and settle in for another epic roundtable talk. Today, I have two of my all-time favorite women joining me, Danielle Dam. Do I say that right? Yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I meant to ask you that prior. Okay, Dame, Dame, is it? Yep. You got like it. A, like a gorgeous dame that you are. Okay. Danielle Dame and Danielle Hamilton. We're diving into the wild world of sugar addiction and all its complexities. Millions of us women, specifically women, struggle with the non-so-sweet cycle of sugar cravings. But have you ever stopped to think about why we crave the sweet stuff? It's all about hormones, glucose regulation, insulin resistance, and let's not forget about the impact that past trauma and sneaky health foods can have on our sugar addiction. But don't worry, we've got you covered. Join us today as we explore the science behind sugar addiction and a segment at the end where we answer our members' burning questions on sugar addiction. We'll be breaking down the hormonal influences, dishing out some practical strategies, and taking you on a journey to a healthier, sugar-free life. All right. Are you ready to kick the sweet tooth to the curve? I hope so, ladies. So let's jump in. First off, I want to introduce you to my two favorite Dannys of all times. Uh, Danielle Dame is a sugar freedom expert and somatic embodiment coach who is passionate about helping women heal their relationship with sugar and themselves so they can reclaim control over their health and energy once and for all. Using her extensive knowledge in nutrition, somatic healing, trauma, personal, and coaching, da Danny helps her clients discover a new way of living in which sugar cravings and guilt no longer controls their health and life. Her root cause approach to addiction understands that our relationship with food ultimately stems from our relationship with ourselves. Danielle is the creator of the Break Free from Sugar program and the host of the top-rated Beyond Sugar Freedom podcast, where she dives deep into conversations about the root causes of sugar dependency and total body health and wellness. Danielle Hamilton, which you guys, this will be Danny D and Danny H as we move forward from here. Danny H is a functional nutritional therapy practitioner and restorative wellness practitioner who specializes in blood sugar regulation and digestion. She became interested in blood sugar issues when she learned that insulin resistance was at the root of her PCOS. She was able to reverse her PCOS, cystic acne, PMS, and weight loss resistance by reversing insulin resistance. Her mission is to help others learn to heal themselves by uncovering and addressing their blood sugar and insulin issues, as most people don't know the early signs, as well as help them to optimize, optimize with a Z, by the way, digestion for low carb diets. That's a little inside joke. Um, <laughs> Daddy promotes a holistic approach to reversing insulin resistance, which goes beyond just changing macros. She is the host of the Unlock the Sugar Shackles podcast and the creator of the Blood Sugar Mastery Program. Woo. And you guys know me, so I'm not going to go into who I am, but I am. But if you're on my podcast, I would love for yeah. people to know you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you do an intro try, if, on your podcast for me? Yeah. Then, when, okay, when, perfect. We'll do that. We'll do that. We'll make something fun up. You wait. <laughs> Be careful uh, that you requested that now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So welcome, my friends. Yay. <laughs> hey, we're here. So excited. I'm super excited to do this because I have to say that every time I have done a podcast on my show about sugar in any form, like whether it's emotional addiction to sugar or blood sugar stuff, insulin resistance, it is always some of the most downloaded and listened to podcasts. So you guys have some of the most downloads on my podcast. And so I really wanted us to come together and bring the three sides, I think the most important sides to blood sugar issues, sugar addiction, and hormonal impact on blood sugar and sugar addiction as well. Um, and just bring it all together because I feel like each of these pieces are so important and we really need all of them. I think we need that like holistic approach if we're struggling with stuff like this. Absolutely. Couldn't agree yeah. more. Yeah, yeah. I'm super excited to have this conversation. We've got some 
yeah, some amazing things planned to talk about today. And um, I'm excited to learn from both of you as well, as we have this more specific conversation. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm constantly referring people to both of you and <laughs> just <too>. seeing that, <laughs> that the you can't talk about, you know, I talk about blood sugar a lot and you can't talk about it without, you know, talking about hormones, without talking about the emotional piece. So I love this little triad that we have because it's really uh, comprehensive. And I think that as we're, as you're listening today, really listen for what is really resonating with you. And maybe one of those first steps, because we might need, you might need help from all three of us, right? Or maybe you're like, wow, the emotional piece is just really popping for me. I feel like that's, you know, this self-sabotage thing or whatever. So paying attention to really just where your, your mind is drawn towards and, and how it feels in your body to hear this information, perhaps some new things and, and seeing where you might want to take your next step. And we all work with people individually. We have coaching programs, we have podcasts. And so it's really exciting that we want to spread this knowledge to all of our audiences, because it, in the end, we, I, I, I know I'm speaking for myself, but I'm, I could probably put these words in your mouth with no problem knowing you as friends that we really want to help people. And this is why we're doing this because we just get so much joy out of connecting people with the person to help them and help their journey. So I personally always tell people, I'm like, if you don't have any need for my program anymore, I'm like, go see Karen, like go help your hormones or go see Danny and, and, and do the inner work because I am not, it's not an ego thing. Like we're here to help connect people because we've been through issues ourselves and we know how deep it and dark it can get. And so I just feel so excited to, you know, share you all and be here today, Karen, um, on your podcast and everyone's podcast, because we're going to put these on all our channels, but excited to reach new people and just see what connects. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. That's amazing. So well yeah. said. Can I, I, I like, can we also share how we actually know each other? I think that could be um, really great for everybody to yeah, kind of get up behind it. the scenes because they're going to, you're all going to see, right? We have a lot of um, jokes or a lot of um, really awesome conversations because, well, I've known Danny, I think I've known you a little bit longer than Karen, yeah. um, but for the last, it's been over a year mm-hmm. at least, right? A year, last yeah. year or two, it's all a blur. Um, we've, we've been masterminding together. So we have a group of five and amazing- co-working human beings and co-working. So we hang out almost every week and support each other in the work that we're doing and in our personal lives. And so we, we know a lot about each other. We're going to have to like, you know, hold back some of it, I'm sure on this podcast, but it's been really, really beautiful to tag on to what you said, Danny. Like that's something that I'm so grateful for both of you. And obviously the other members of our mastermind that like, we have this, this, real deep drive to like really change the world and have a huge impact. And we do that by coming together to support each other, not competing against each other. Right. And really owning our own gifts and our own. I mean, we all kind of approach this, which is why we're doing this round table with such a different angle and a different piece of the puzzle. And it just feels really beautiful. And I wish more women could get together specifically and and do this and lift each other up instead of trying to compete against each other. And, uh, you know, that's a, the big part of the inner work that we'll get to later, you know, that I, yeah. I just feel so grateful for your, you both, you know, in my personal life, in my business, um, helping me answer questions from clients. Like we really, really lean on each other um, and, and support each other in a big way. And yeah, I'm just so grateful and about time we're doing this together. And it's our, always our running joke, us. everyone, that we're such good friends. Like we literally talk to each other every day and we've never seen each other's legs. Never, <laughs> never met in person, but that's changing but this do year. You have legs, <laughs> you've got have nice legs. legs. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yes. Zoom I've friends. I think we can all relate friends. over the last two years, right? Just having Zoom friends. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, off that, I want to start by just simply talking about and recognizing where we are right now in this day and age, you know, it's 2023. And I was walking through the mall the other day and I was looking at this chocolate shop that was going on in one area. And then there was ice cream in another area and then popcorn. And I'm like, no wonder we have such a hard time sticking to the diet, sticking to the healthy eating. And I was like, for the rest of our lives, we will constantly always 
be tempted no matter where we go. And I think about it as, you know, we know that sugar is as addictive as cocaine is, if not more. It lights up the same amount of the pleasure centers in your brain. And so it's like the cocaine addict, imagine if wherever he went, if he opened up his fridge, he went to a restaurant, he's walking through a mall, he's walking through downtown, the people were just like shoving cocaine in that person's face, like, and them having to be like, nope, I'm just going to say no today. Like it's, that's how challenging it is when you're addicted to sugar. That is so, that is such a powerful analogy because it almost feels like, no, it can't be, but it is so true. And someone who is trying to get off of alcohol, we don't say, well, just come meet me at the bar and we'll be there instead. But you can't, I mean, TV commercials, containers, family members, foods, when you go to a party, holidays, I mean, food and especially sugar and treats are just have infiltrated our culture, our traditions. And so for, at least for my people in my program, we work on how to have a really balanced approach with that because we want to be really healthy, but we also want to enjoy life and, you know, take part in some of these traditions. So it's about finding, I think, what boundary really works for you. For some people, it needs to be a really, you know, solid boundary if they sort of identify with that sugar addiction piece and they just, they can't have one little drop of something or else it'll lead to a cascade. There is that subset of people where that exists. And then for others, we can sort of do this inner work. We can work on our blood sugar, our hormones. We can do the inner work and we can improve our relationship to food, nourish our bodies, stabilize our blood sugar. So we're not having these intense cravings and we can enjoy our, you know, meal on the holidays with our family and then get back to our normal life. That's really supportive. That's set up to support our health and our optimal way of living. And so I love that idea of that we can find this balance, but it's, it's something that we need to work hard to figure out what that is. And it's a spectrum, isn't it? It's like, yeah. like you said, it's that you, you need to be able to recognize where on the spectrum are you? Are you so bad that there are some people that I've worked with who can't have any amount of sugar because it's a runaway train. Yeah. And then there's other people that need to get control of the physical stuff, the insulin resistance, they can change their diet, they can fix their hormones. And then those cravings aren't there and they can do the 80, 20, you know, 20% of the time I'm going to eat my chocolate and they do really well that way. But you really need to know where are you on this spectrum? Yeah. 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 I want to add to that yeah. because like what I've really seen, and you know, I have some really strong beliefs about this. Like I agree with everything that you're both saying, and I also want to lovingly call out a lot of people because what I really see is women thinking that they've done all those things, right? Thinking, well, I've, right. I've fixed my hormones. Yep. I've fixed my gut. I've done all the inner healing. I've, I've, I've done all the pieces and I still just can't shake these sugar cravings. So that must mean that I'm a hardcore addict and I should never have sugar again and, and dealing with that. And I believe there's a lot of people out there actually mislabeling themselves in that way, because I think there's a lot of women actually doing those things half-ass. I'm going to say it, right? Yeah. Yep. Half-ass fixing their hormones, like half-ass healing their gut and not fully getting into the depth of the trauma and the nervous system and the emotions and the stuff that I'll definitely talk about later. Um, and kind of just feeling like maybe they've touched on everything and then just given up and said, I must just be a hardcore sugar addict. So those people definitely exist, but I just want to want to give some hope to those of you out there who are like, well, I've done all this stuff that you ladies are talking about. And it's just, I must just be an addict and it's not working. Um, I believe that there's always more work to be done, especially when we're getting into our inner healing. Uh, there's always layers that I believe most people can uncover and heal from and get to this place where, you know, there, there might be a healthy moderation or a choice to have sugar out of a place of love and it not, you know, spiral downward from there. Yeah. yeah. I noticed even for I myself, that. I got to call myself, you know, bullshit on myself constantly because yeah. I'll be like suddenly craving so much sugar and I'm eating way more sugar than usual. And I'll be like, maybe I should start taking berberine again or go low carb. And I'll be thinking about, you know, the easy routes. And then I'll be like, bullshit, Karen, you are so <laughs> stressed out. No wonder you're craving sugar. And I know, okay, I need to deal with my stress. And as soon as I do that, 
the sugar cravings go away every single time. So I do have to do it to myself, but it is good to be very aware of like, oh, could this maybe, could I've been done a little bit more over in this area, you know, before doing that or working on my food or my hormones or yeah, you're right. You're totally right, Danny. We live in a quick fix world. We want quick fix. Yeah. And, and I think it's also important to share that we have probably been in some way or another, or one of us have actually been in maybe some of the situations that you've been in. Like I was a mega, I, I I wouldn't say sugar addict, but I would say I used to have a a sweet tooth. I would say every tooth in my mouth is sweet. And (laughs) I, I would have this sugar dragon that would tell me what to do. And so we are coming to this from a place of like, we've been in a lot of this, not every single, but in many of the situations that you guys are in as well. And so we can really empathize with how difficult it is and how difficult it is to, to go deeper. So Danny, when you're saying like half-assed healing, it's not because they don't want to (laughs) maybe sometimes, but it's because it's, it's, you haven't maybe maybe this is where it's worth it to invest, to work with someone one-on-one instead of just like, oh, I listen to all these podcasts. Like we get so much information from podcasts. That's why we're doing this. But sometimes it's not enough to like just do this surface level stuff. And we really need to dig deeper. So we're going to give you a lot of information that will maybe help you deepen your understanding. And then perhaps seeing like, do I need to work with someone on this issue? Uh, and prioritizing that is, is another piece of it. And just to say one more, just little aside is that when someone is dealing with, let's say, um, an addiction to cocaine, to use, uh, Karen's example, you know, you're not going to come into a place where you're confronted with cocaine, but we need to eat every single day. Just like you said, like it's bombarded, but we need to eat. So it, can be just so complex and it can be so confusing. And I see some people out there like, oh, it's not hard. Nutrition's not hard. And it's like, yes, it freaking is. I'm sorry. It is because there are people, there are parents out there being like, I gave my kid protein waffles. I don't understand why she's having a temper tantrum. True story. And it's like protein waffles. Like there's not really that much protein in those waffles. Like there it's marketing. So all these companies are out to make, to sell products. And we are just reading all these marketing claims on things and thinking we're doing the right thing. Like I, my mom brought my baby book here and I saw all these times I was taking all these medications and I'm like, oh my gosh, like these antibiotics. And it's like, but my mom was just doing the best she could. She's like, I feel so guilty for the way I fed you. I'm like, ma, you were feeding me according to the food pyramid. You were buying your tricks. Tricks are for kids. Like you were following what they said, you know? So no one here is like pointing blame at anyone for how they're doing things. Like we are just trying to all do our best and trying to sift through. Like I just saw a post today. Someone sent it to me that says sugar is good for us. Sugar doesn't make you gain weight. And I'm just like, Oh my God. People are, it, it, it's yeah. just, it's confusing out there. <laughs> so it's if you're confused, confusing. <laughs> you're in the right place. Yeah. So. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you if you're confused. And like, yeah. I, I want to mention on that too, right? That, that is one of the brilliant marketing tactics, right? The more confused yeah. we all are, especially when it comes to our health and True. healing, the easier it is to swoop in with a solution, right? Here's this pharmaceutical or here's this magic cereal that's been fortified with vitamin D or whatever, right? And and solve the problems. Here's all the keto this. And like, so this mass confusion around nutrition is not your fault. And it's definitely, um, one of the, one of the brilliant marketing tricks to kind of, uh, get us to buy a solution, right? When I fully believe we all have that solution within, we don't need to outsource that. We got, we got to stop outsourcing our health and, and really learn to tune in and trust our bodies again. And, um, that's what you're all going to start doing after you've heard this podcast after today. today. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to yeah. say that. I was going to say, you know, we get all co- very caught up in listening to the podcasts and collecting information. And when we collect information, we feel like we're doing something for ourselves. We feel like we're being proactive, but then we're not implementing. So I want everybody moving forward in this conversation that's listening, take action at the end of it so on yeah. something, one, one something thing. that we've discussed about, take action on it. Yeah. One thing, one action and move on to the next podcast. All right. Um, So what I want us to do now is I want each of us to explain to the listeners how they could recognize if it could be, you know, hormones driving the sugar addiction. 
how, how could we recognize if it's maybe uncomfortable feelings, trauma, past emotional stuff, or just current emotional stuff? And then for you, Downey H, tell us about the spectrum of, you know, insulin resist. Like when we're looking at numbers, our blood sugar numbers, how can we recognize that there's a problem in that? Um, so maybe um, Danny H, maybe you should just start there because that's, I think the fundamentals that we really need to look at first is what is our blood sugar doing in the body? Absolutely. So sugar is a fuel source. And when it goes into our bloodstream, the blood sugar that we're talking about is glucose. So sometimes you'll hear those used interchangeably. So when we eat, especially carbohydrates and sometimes protein, the food digests and our liver pumps out some sugar into our bloodstream. So then the amount of sugar in our blood goes up. The body likes to have about a teaspoon of sugar in the blood at all times, give or take a tiny amount. So with our blood sugar, the body likes to have it in this Goldilocks range, not too high, not too low, just right. And that's where it feels happy and balanced and satiated. And it's like, cool, I have a little bit of energy if I need it and it's good. So when we eat something that's very high in let's say processed carbohydrates, we get a really big increase in the amount of sugar in our blood after the food digests. And that increase in the sugar signals to our pancreas, stay with me, don't glaze over, it's easy to understand, I'll make it easy. The pancreas produces this hormone called insulin and insulin's job is to take the sugar out of the cells, out of the blood and put it into the cells. So the insulin's like, here, glucose, come with me. It's going to knock on the door of the cell. Maybe it's a liver cell. Maybe it's a muscle cell. Maybe it's a brain cell. And it's going to say, hey, I have some sugar for you. And it's like, sure, come on in. So then the glucose goes inside the cell and it makes energy. Or if it's too much, it'll store it for later as body fat. So the, the insulin is that hormone that tries, that lets the glucose into the cell. So what happens when we eat a really big carbohydrate rich meal, we get a really big rise in, in glucose. And oftentimes we get like a huge spike of insulin. And so the insulin's putting away the sugar into the cells. So the amount in the blood is coming down. And then sometimes it puts away too much. And that's where we start to go into what I call the craving zone. So as the blood sugar is dropping very low because the insulin's putting it all away, this is usually when we start to feel our very first signs of blood sugar dysregulation. We start to feel this can also happen when we're hungry or if a meal is delayed, this would be the very first signs that sort of come out because as the blood sugar is going down, the body sort of sends on this light in the car, like the, the, the gas light. And so the gas light comes on and it says, Hey, you need fuel really quick. And what the gas light feels like in our body, it feels like anxiety, shakiness, dizziness, weakness, fatigue, heart palpitations, headaches. Uh, we might feel nauseous. We may feel, um, we may feel really irritable. We might feel very, um, like we're, our hunger is so, so urgent and it's, it's, we feel hangry. So this hanger is a really early sign of having some blood sugar dysregulation. Healthy hunger feels like hunger, like, oh, you know, it's lunchtime, but let me just finish this, uh, you know, little task that I was working on, or I just went to this gym class but let me just run this quick errand before I head home and have lunch. So that's what healthy hunger feels like. It could be put off. It's not like I can't think I'm getting angry. I'm yelling at my spouse. It's, it's fine. It's just a sign like, oh, I could eat. I didn't know that existed. <laughs> my hunger used to me be the neither. first one. <laughs> okay. So I would turn to the person in the Snickers commercials. Remember those? Yeah. And where you like, it's like hungry, you need a Snickers, whatever. And you like, the person was Joe Pesci and then like turned into, you know, like a nice young girl. And so if you are the Joe Pesci in the Snickers commercial, that is an early sign of blood sugar issues. And as what happens, so the blood sugar goes low. And now your body is sending you messages to get quick energy because it's out of energy. And so the quick energy is usually the form of processed carbohydrates or caffeine or something. So you're going to go to Starbucks, you're going to stop at the gas station, you're going to grab a muffin from the break room, you're going to get quick carbs. And that it's not going to be like, hey, why don't you make a nice grass fed steak with some local organic broccoli? Like, no, <laughs> like, give me, get me to Starbucks ASAP, right? So, get, you know, give me the M&Ms. It's going to be something fast. So what's that going to do? It's going to shoot the blood sugar back up again. Then it's going to crash again. And we have 
like sealed ourselves into the blood sugar roller coaster. Okay, so this up and down and up and down and up and down. The more we spike our blood sugar, the more often we're going to need to eat. And what does this do to our insulin levels? It raises our insulin levels over time. The more often we eat, the more off, the higher we spike our blood sugar. Insulin takes a longer time to come down than glucose does. So we get these high levels of insulin and then we start developing insulin resistance because the insulin is in the blood and it, the body just is kind of like, it's like, Hey, I have some sugar for you. And it's like, dude, you were already here. So it's sort of like not listening to the message of the insulin anymore. And so the insulin starts to build up and this causes all sorts of hormonal dysregulations. And then it also impairs the body's ability to burn fat for fuel because the body with high insulin in the blood is in a fat storage mode. It can't access the stored sugar that's in your liver. It can't access your body fat to burn. So it's dependent on carbohydrates that you eat for fuel. So if you feel like you're just stuck, like no matter what I do, I can't stop eating carbs because I don't feel well then it's probably an issue of some sort of metabolic inflexibility, which is now they're saying it affects over 93% of the adult US population. I'm sure North American population, because maybe Canada is not far behind us. Maybe they are, maybe they are hopefully there. But yeah, so 93% of people are dealing with this where the insulin levels are too high. We can't burn our body fat for fuel. So we're dependent on a steady stream of carbohydrates to keep our blood sugar up. And then as we keep spiking our blood sugar and then keep needing to eat and sort of sort of correct this problem, we progress along this journey of what I call the diabetes and insulin resistance spectrum. So now instead of the issues just being maybe when we're hungry or like maybe a little bit after a meal, then it's sort of all the time. And because our blood sugar and insulin affect every single cell organ and process in our body, the blood sugar issues that we can have are very widespread. They affect all of our organ systems, like, you know, our brain, we get memory loss and anxiety issues and brain fog. And then, you know, with our eyes, macular degeneration, very common in diabetes and our teeth and gum disease and whatever, our heart leading cause insulin resistance is the leading cause of high blood pressure and all these things. So you can go down the entire body and look at all these issues. And so it's seemingly unrelated when I had, PCOS and acne, and I had tendonitis in my ankle. It was like, what is the connecting factor? It's like the inflammation from the, the blood sugar spikes and the insulin resistance. So as the, the metabolic dysfunction gets worse, we start to see these different issues get more severe and then be more widespread. So we might have more issues. So we might have high blood pressure and anxiety, have cholesterol issues. Our blood sugar numbers start ticking up because now when the insulin is not being heard by the cells, the insulin is sitting in the blood, but so is that glucose. It can't get into the cells. So the amount of sugar in our blood starts rising and rising and rising. And so that's when the doctor, you know, this will be happening for decades. And then the doctor's like, oh yeah, you have prediabetes, but just, you know, maybe eat healthier and, and, and move more. And you're like, well, I've been doing that. And, and they miss it. They miss these early stages. So, um, Karen, you talked about the ideal lab ranges. So let me get my calculator out for the millimoles. Um, so basically what doctors tend to miss are the very early signs of blood sugar issues. So ideally we want our fasting blood sugar to be about 70 to 85. So in millimoles, that's 3.8 to 4.7. So any number I say, just divide by 18 or times by 18. So that would be an ideal fasting range. So when you wake up within the first hour, you know, hour or two, you uh, will take your blood sugar and that's the number that you want. A lot of people are between that 85 and like 99 points. So 99 is uh, 5.5. So if you're in that range, that's where the doctors will miss you because they're going to be like, oh, it's fine. It's under hundred. So, but this is already, we start to see that research has shown that you are much more at a higher tendency to develop type two diabetes from, but what I see in my practice is that these people with their blood sugar slightly elevated like this fasting, they're already having issues. They're already showing signs 
of all those things that I said earlier. They're having this dysregulated hunger and things like that. Uh, another area where doctors miss is anyone who comes in who's hypoglycemic. My blood sugar was 60 when I went into the blood into the doctor. That's 3.3. I felt like I was going to pass out. I did almost like blackout. I was super shaky. I was like, I hate blood work because I'm a breakfast person. That was my that was, <laughs> that was what too. I thought was going on, you know? Um so I was a breakfast person, but my blood sugar was crashing and the, no doctor said anything to me. And meanwhile I felt horrible. I didn't tell him. I just thought well, it's because I didn't eat breakfast, but that's not normal. If we don't eat breakfast, our body should tap into those other fuel sources, right? Like it should use the stored sugar in the liver. It should use our body fat to power us through. I'm not saying we need to be able to fast for 24 hours and feel excellent, but we should be able to skip breakfast for, you know, push it back two hours, right? Mm -hmm. We should have that little bit of flexibility. And if we don't, there's some dysfunction there. And then I def default to the doctor's ranges for pre-diabetes and diabetes, which is hundred and then 126. So like that 5.5 range and then 126 is seven millimoles. So if you're fasting, glucose is above there. Um, then there might be some issues, but some people might have perfect fasting numbers, or they might check their blood sugar. They're in a normal range and they're feeling horrendous. They feel anxious. They feel panicky. They wake up in the middle of the night, their heart's pounding. They check their blood sugar, normal range. What's going on? Is it the blood sugar? Or is it not? It is, <laughs> it is metabolic dysfunction. And this is where there's so much gaslighting from doctors. So we see a lot of people come in, they eat a meal several hours later, the, the, or even just a little while later, the blood sugar is kind of plummeting and they're starting to feel really panicky and shaky. And this is because the body's used to these blood sugar numbers being at a higher set point. And so they just start to feel really, really terrible at these ranges. And they go to their doctor and they say, well, your blood sugar is fine. So you probably just need an anxiety medication. So I see a ton of people like that experiencing this gaslighting from doctors who are saying, well, it can't be hypoglycemia. It's not below 50 or 60. And it is. It is postprandial syndrome. It is metabolic dysfunction. And there's a lot of other things that need to you know, we need to work on if that's you, but I just want you to know that all of those things are blood sugar issues. And all of those things on that entire spectrum can be reversed and we can go towards that optimal healthy hunger. We can get rid of these symptoms. I did it and I was pretty, you know, far advanced and I help people do it all the time. Um, type one diabetes, there's still no cure for yet. I just want to call that out. So anytime I say diabetes, I'm talking about type two, um, but even type one diabetics, you, they are fed this information, like eat whatever you want, just dose with insulin. And the leading cause of death for people with type one diabetes is heart disease. And they're over, they're dosing themselves with a ton of insulin. And we see that happen in people without diabetes too. So even if you have type one, it's still important to you know, have your blood sugar really, really tightly controlled um, for optimal health. And so, yeah. Uh, oh, two, but CGMs. just two and two more questions. Sure. What is ideal fasting insulin and hemoglobin A1C? Because sometimes fasting glucose, we have this, you know, the abnormal high fasting glucose, but then we have normal insulin and normal. Yes. So that is a really good point. So insulin, this is a, a, a metric that I want you to ask your doctor for. I want you to go in and ask specifically for a fasting insulin test. Insulin is the hormone. Glucose is the sugar. So they're two separate things. So we can get a fasting glucose monitor or a finger prick monitor, and that's at home. But the insulin test, we can ask our doctors, sometimes they won't give it. There are companies that do this um, where you can order the lab yourself. Um, but the fasting insulin range ideal is approximately like between two and six, or I've heard below five. So it's something very low. Um, the other thing is that doctors will say the range is like below 20 or below 25. So yeah. that is very progressed insulin resistance at that stage. So that's really important to keep in mind. So this is a really important test to get. If you're a person with reactive hypoglycemia, you may find that you have really good insulin and you might have very low insulin. So maybe your insulin fasting is like a two and, but you're still having these issues. And that means that you're too sensitive to the insulin, that your body is hypersensitive for a variety of reasons. So I just 
Um, the insulin resistance is not the only reason for reactive hypoglycemia. And then um, I know I talk fast. I'm just trying to save time here. Um, <laughs> and then the ideal fast, the ideal A1C. So just a caveat, A1C is a measure of your average glucose levels over the past three months. So if you're someone who has chronically high glucose levels, it would make sense that we would want to see that number tick down. However, a lot of people have blood sugar swings, which means they have highs and lows and highs and lows. What's the average of a high number and a low number is a really good number, right? It's that middle number. So a lot of people, again, with this, you know, reactive hypoglycemia type blood sugar pattern is that they have these highs and lows and the blood sugar, the doctor says, oh, your A1C is normal. So you must not have problems, but it's not a sensitive test. So that's where continuous glucose monitors really come in. So the A1C that we're looking for is approximately the best would probably be like a 4.8 to a about like a, maybe a 5.3, a 5.2. So we, we want to keep it in that tight range. If you're like a little on the outsides of that, that can be okay too. Um, doctors will say you can be up to like, we want to be below 5.7 and that's an average blood sugar of 126, like, which is that that's 7.0. If my blood sugar is averaging up there, that's way too high. In my opinion, I think you're going to have a lot of issues there. So, um, maybe I would say 4.8 to a 5.2 would be, we want to keep that, that range really tight. And then the last thing would be that continuous glucose monitor in, uh, in the U S you need a prescription for it. There's tons of companies that give that provide you with the prescription and, or the prescription and the device. And you can get these devices, put them on you in other countries. You don't need the prescription. And it's so helpful to see how foods affect you, how foods, stress, sleep, lack of sleep, movement, all these factors are impacting our blood sugar and you can start to personalize your diet. You might start connecting. Oh my goodness. Every single time I have a panic attack, it's because my blood sugar crashed or every time I wake up in the middle of the night, it's because my blood sugar dipped or every time I get that afternoon headache, it's actually because my, my blood sugar went really high after my lunch. So we can start to connect with our body and we can take the guesswork out and we can stop maybe medicating for example, like I don't have enough energy when I wake up. So I have caffeine and I don't have enough energy after my meal. So I have another, you know, piece of candy or I can't fall asleep at night. So I do this by optimizing your blood sugar. You can avoid, um, you can correct all those symptoms. Awesome. That was, that was great. Great tutorial. Yeah. Just a, <laughs> everything I know just in like five minutes. Exactly. Sorry guys. <laughs> Hope you're okay. <laughs> that was more than five minutes. <laughs> but that's so Sorry. much good information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause most people, the ranges that the doctors have are brutal. Like fasting insulin is, it goes from two to 25 in Canada. It's like, yeah. really, come on. So yeah, I think that that's a very big eye opener for most people to hear what their lab ranges should look like. So yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, let's talk about what are we looking for if somebody's like, I don't know if I have an emotional problem with my sugar, if that's what's driving my sugar addiction. Is there things that people could explore to that could maybe help them to see maybe that, that there is or is there always? Yeah, yes. Yes. The second one. So, um, yeah, such a good question. Definitely. I wholeheartedly believe we all have an emotional connection to food, right? We all like it is, it is, they go hand in hand ever since childbirth, the first time we breastfeed, right? Food means comfort. And actually more specifically, even that sweet taste of our mother's milk means comfort and connection and love. And we start really deeply associating a whole array of emotions with food. So I absolutely wholeheartedly believe we all are at some sort of spectrum and in the world of emotional eaters. It's, it's part of being a human being. And the fact that most of us, especially here in North America, and I know in Europe and I have clients all the world, all over the world, and everybody seems to have the consensus in this when, you know, we, we've, 
just grew up in a society that doesn't actually honor our emotions. So this is where I'm really passionate and a lot of uh, a lot of the inner work that I call the root cause pieces that I get into with my clients around addictive patterning and behaviors with sugar. Um, really, we have to first look at the emotional piece because uh, most of us every single day as human beings have emotions, right? We go through the whole range and in a day's a journey, sometimes we might feel 20 different emotions and that's okay. And that's part of being a human. But when we have used and become so accustomed to like using sugar and using food, um, it's never really a cucumber. I'm just going to say that, right. We're never like, Oh, I'm feeling really stressed. I'm going to go eat a cucumber, right? Like that doesn't happen. <laughs> so we, we really need to take a hard look at the way that we actually learn to, to, cope with and support our emotional response as a human being. So this is like a huge topic and a huge conversation, obviously. But um, if you're sitting there listening to this and really not sure uh, if you're an emotional eater or not, I'm here telling you, you are, <laughs> I'm going to boldly say that. And I just want you to start the place that I always have my clients start is just starting to pay attention to your emotions throughout the day. That's step one, because that's going to be really eye-opening. It's about 50, 50 in, in my program and the clients that I work with in terms of, um, actually women, not even being able to feel emotions. And this is a huge problem, um, societally, not you specifically, or there's nothing wrong with you. This is just a systemic issue with the society that we are raised in is we are taught to really push those emotions down. And for some reason in our childhood, it wasn't safe to express emotions or we weren't accepted or we didn't fit in or just all of these, all of these, these pieces that are stored in us. So there's uh, a lot of women. And I just want to call this out for any of you who are sitting there going, I don't know what I feel right now. Uh, that's okay. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of walls that we've built up, a lot of layers of an onion that we have put on to protect ourselves from being hurt, from being emotionally vulnerable, and then hurt. So this is a very normal disconnection. Uh, a lot of women that I work with are, are disconnected from their bodies, are disconnected from what their bodies are telling them, what they're feeling. So that's, that's absolutely okay. And there's a way to, you know, really reconnect, right. That takes a lot of work and a, and a lot of practice. And that's what I help my clients with, but ultimately we want to get to a place where we can recognize our emotional reactions on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, oh, I'm stressed or like Karen, you were sharing earlier, right. Oh, I'm stressed and I, I want this quick fix, or I want this, um, you know, or I'm feeling really sad or I'm feeling lonely or I'm feeling really happy. It's Friday and I'm excited and I want to go out for drinks and cake with my friends. Right. So just really starting to square one is to starting to pay attention to your emotions throughout the day and maybe even keeping a journal, especially around when you're about to put something in your mouth, whether it's a drink or food, you know, what emotional state are you actually in? And that exercise, if you actually track that for a week, even a couple of days, you're going to get some really great feedback about your specific emotional triggers around food. You'll start noticing a pattern like, oh my goodness, every time I'm bored, I'm eating. And then you can start to really decipher between this emotional hunger versus physical hunger, right? Because most of the time, ladies, we're not actually eating because we need nutrients. We're eating because it's late at night and we've got Netflix on and or we're socializing with friends or we're bored at work. That was a big one for me. I was like, oh, and my blood sugar crashed at two o'clock every day at work. <laughs> I was like, I need something to eat. So there is just obviously a huge combination with what Danny H was just sharing, but also this emotional component is absolutely massive. And I'll just, I'll, I'll share this off the bat. Most people, most women ignore this because it's extremely difficult. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is, this is hard work, like relearning how to honor your emotions and, and repattern the beliefs that we have about, about what it means to have emotions as a human being and understanding the importance of the energetics of releasing those emotions on our long-term health. This is a huge piece of the health puzzle that I think most people forget. We talk about exercise, we talk about sleep, we talk about hydration and nutrition. The emotional component is massive. And the, I mean, you can do your own research, but they're they're now proving that those who really suppress themselves and their emotions their whole life are actually developing diseases like MS, even cancer. 
Um, I know Gabor Maté has done a lot of work in this as well, like really seeing this, the sacrificing of our, our full expression as human beings throughout our whole lives actually changes our cells. It actually is, is like a toxin in our body, right? If you're drinking alcohol every day, since you were born, right, you're going to have a toxic overload in your body and it's going to start, start speaking up about that. So it's the same with the actual energy of emotions that we need to start unpacking our baggage there, ladies, and, and learning how to do that in a really loving and safe way. Um, if we ever really want to want to get back in the driver's seat, especially around those impulses and those cravings towards food. Yeah. And I'll, I'll chime in here with my own experience with that, like listening to you even just talk about it. And I'm like, I really don't do well with a lot like strong emotions. I'm not somebody that expresses strong emotions. I'm pretty like even keel. And I'm like, well, I wonder why is that a problem? And I'm thinking this in my head as you're talking. And then I'm like, growing up, my parents rarely showed strong emotion. Like I wasn't taught to express that as a child. I wasn't given a safe space to express a lot of emotion. Yeah. So I think that a lot of that got stuffed down. And yeah. I, yeah. And then being a body worker, I did body work for 17 years and, and I was taught in school, but also in my practice, I saw this every single day, which was people store their emotions. Like you said, in their body, if you are not expressing those emotions, what happens in the inside, like chemically, there is a chemical release, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. And so if you're not expressing outward, whatever that emotion is, that has to go somewhere and it will get trapped in your body. And it's not woo woo. This is scientific. Um, it will tend to store things in our chakras, like so different chakra areas, like voice chakra is right here. Karen's had a thyroid problem her whole life. I wonder why, you know, because I wasn't given the opportunity to express feelings. So there is, you know, there's so much science behind this now that it's not woo woo. And there is, you can absolutely I mean, cause it causes disease. It causes pain. And there's been books written about this, about back pain being associated with emotions. And so, yeah, a hundred percent it's, yeah. It, I, yeah, I just, yeah. yeah. And it spikes our cortisol, which spikes our blood sugar, which, and it, sure. it reduces our ability to digest our food. So we're more nutrient depleted. Like it has that spiral. It has that potential to spiral into this, you know, these physical manifestations of things. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I see who have that low blood sugar problem where stress is like the biggest piece of it. And this emotional stress, even I'm learning, I'm, I have this device on me and I'm learning that I breathe incorrectly. And the way I breathe is like really shallow clavicular breathing and it stresses my nervous system out. So I'm stressed out all the time for no reason. I mean, it, it's just wild. And then, you know, like you said, where we were not especially as women, I feel like we're told to, you know, don't be a bitch or don't be bossy or don't, you know, be a people pleaser, don't be angry. And so I'm never angry. I'm just frustrated. (laughs) And, (laughs) you know, my mom, like I crying was okay in my family. So I can, I can go sadness. Like I feel super comfortable (laughs) with that. But other than that, I'm sort of out and I am currently working with a somatic therapist because it's like talk therapy doesn't get at it. You really need to go into the body and know what a feeling feels like for me, it's just like, it feels like a gut punch and I'm like, something's wrong, but let me think about it. Should I do it or not? So I just actively suppress all my feelings. Like I have a feeling and I don't know how to listen to my body in that way. So I love that. That's sort of what you're teaching people to do. And I'm teaching people to listen to their body in another way, like listen to your symptoms and things like that. So it's this tuning in to what we need because we're all so bio-individual. And I think that's, it's such a great place to start that journaling exercise. I love it. Yeah. It's really simple, easy, easy place to get started with this. And it, and it really, you know, I want to just mention how I sort of came about this and why I do what I do is like, I I, and I, I would be curious to see what you ladies see, but I think we've all noticed this, right? That there's this, uh, this tendency, especially when it comes to getting off of sugar and obviously regulating our blood sugar to just go off carbs, right? Go off sugar, get that junk out of our body, which is really good, really important. Don't get me wrong. I'm totally on board with that. Um, but at kind of this belief that that's going to solve all the problems. And mm-hmm. what I know all my clients come to me after even being off sugar for three months, six months, a year, 
and noticing that then something happens in their life and they're right back into the binging cycle again, right? Some huge event happens or a vacation or a death or a pandemic, right? And it just totally spirals downward. So that made me really curious about, okay, so what's going on beyond the physical, right? Like once our blood sugar is regulated and our hormones are bang on, like, why are people, why are women still in this addictive pattern in this binging addictive cycle? And that's where I became really fascinated with uncovering more of the energetic, emotional nervous system root causes. And, and what I call like doing the inner work where we need to fill these uh, foundations in our crack in our, our cracks in our foundation, should I say, um, so that we can build a strong house, right? This strong relationship with food, with ourselves, um, and really, you know, really, really do that healing from the inside out. So you can all see that this all ties together, right? We need all of what Karen, Danny H and I are, are talking about, but this is, yeah, this is a really important area that I think a lot of women ignore, um, this like really tuning back in and really, um, really going inward to build that, that sense of self and resiliency and, and, and really do that work in the body. And this is something that I'm noticing even more and more. And as my practice is even shifting as, as both Karen and Danny know, uh, you know, newly being a somatic embodiment coach and really understanding that we can do this beautiful mindset work as well. And I think a lot of people get really hooked into that, right? We read all the books and listen to all the podcasts and mindset hacks and how to build a habit and how to change your beliefs. And I even host a masterclass on that. It's amazing, really important. But until we marry our, our subconscious patterning, our mindset, our ego stuff with what's actually being stored in our body and our nervous system from childhood and from a lifetime of trauma and life as a human being, we will never fully be able to be free. And that, that's, a, that's a really strong belief that I have. And, and science backs that now, like there has to be there has to be some sort of dropping from the head into the heart, into the body. Um, if, if we ever really want to rid ourselves, especially of anxiety and worry and nervous system issues and this emotional baggage that we're carrying and all these pieces. So our body is so wise. We need to start like loving it, listening to it. hundred percent. Love it and yeah. listen. <laughs> See, this is why I refer people to you. We need yeah. that. <laughs> Bring it on. Yes. Yeah, I can talk about this it. all day. I love it. Uh, okay. So hormones then my turn. Yes. Let's oh, do it. Goodness. Let's talk. Let's talk to Karen. Uh, I've got a question for you, Karen. Um, so obviously the hormone guru herself, tell us a little bit about then how, like how do hormones play into all of this? How do mm -hmm. hormones actually drive sugar addiction or even, you know, some people out there might relate more to the sugar craving sort of language. So how does that all tie in and, and really, you know, drive us there? Yeah, so hormones have both direct and indirect influence on sugar cravings. So first directly when we're fertile women, so you're, you know, between the ages of let's say 20 and we'll do 35 typically is the cutoff <laughs> is what I say. Um, before every, before shit hits the fan, no, <laughs> but yes, so that in the, in between those years, when you're in your right fertile years, the most common source of that sugar craving that was driving the sugar cravings is typically cortisol, thyroid, and of course, insulin as well, which these are play in with insulin. So insulin's always tied in with this, but we'll say thyroid, cortisol, insulin and testosterone, oddly enough, which is really directly, that's kind of probably an indirect, but that's through insulin. So these are the most common causes in our fertile years. Cortisol, obviously stress. Cortisol, we all know this is our fight or flight hormone. Um, either if you are constantly high in cortisol, which I see all the time, um, your body A has to raise blood sugar because it thinks you're going to fight or you're going to run anytime soon. So if you're doing what every other North American woman's doing out there and you're going to school or you are got a family or you got a job and you're working full time and you're running around and you think, oh, this is so normal. I'm just doing what everybody else is doing. Oh, and then if you were like me, partying every single night, all night long, getting up, doing it all over again and thinking you're getting away with it. Well, your cortisol 
is then always coming on. It's always pumping out, pump, 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 blood sugar, pump, pump, pump. And then we go back to what Danny talked about, Danny H, which is now we're going to become a little bit insulin resistant because that blood sugar is constantly having to come on, be pumped out so that you can, what your body thinks is going to be fight or flight. Your body doesn't know on the inside that, no, this is just every day. This is what women do now. <laughs> the body doesn't know this and the body can't tolerate it very well. Second to that thyroid, there is a lot of thyroid hypothyroidism with women right now. We have way more hypothyroidism than men do. I think a lot of it is emotional, talking about the not being able to speak our minds, not feeling safe to speak our minds. So I think there's that. I think there's toxic load. There's a lot of autoimmune. This is a whole nother podcast, but thyroid, when you think about how it relates to your metabolism, how it slows things down, it will also slow down how you are processing sugar. So both insulin. So if you're insulin resistant and you're not getting energy, that's going to affect your thyroid. But if your thyroid's low, it's going to affect how you process insulin. So they go, it's a back and forth relationship. So whenever I see somebody that's got hypothyroidism, if they're, if it's untreated or not treated properly, which is all the time, they'll tend to have some degree of insulin resistance. Like it's, they just do, they go hand in hand with each other. So there's that. And then we've got polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is what Danny H had. This is the number one cause of infertility right now in women. There's once again, whole nother podcast, but safe to say when your body starts to pour out insulin, it actually makes it so that your ovaries start pouring out testosterone. It causes that. So in this, you know, roundabout way, this high testosterone goes alongside high insulin, high blood sugar. And it's really, really common and it's really devastating. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've had women come to me that were told by their doctor that there was nothing they could do about it except go on birth control pills. That's it. That's yeah, me. Yeah. That was me. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. that's their answer. I was told I had to take the pill and that there was no cure. Yeah. All the time. I get this all the time. So those are the, I would say the most direct issues when it comes to hormones and blood sugar in our fertile years. Then as we start aging, things really get haywire with our blood sugar. And I will tell you right now, I don't know if the, I would say 90%, if not a hundred percent of women, if they don't replace their hormones in menopause will develop some degree of insulin resistance or type two diabetes. It is just, and same with men, it's not just women, but we all will because of the loss of our hormones. Our hormones are that important for processing glucose in the body. So first we start losing our progesterone. Progesterone has an effect on insulin regulation. Next goes estrogen. Estrogen is extremely important to help us be insulin sensitive and helps us to process glucose. So by the time we get to our 50s, we've lost both progesterone and estrogen, which is why we start to develop some degree of insulin resistance. So women will come to me and say, I haven't changed anything. I haven't changed my diet. I work out. I eat super healthy. I eat paleo. I eat keto. I, I intermittent fast. Why do I have insulin resistance? Why did I suddenly put on 10 pounds in my belly? It's because these hormones are so important to process blood sugar. Then there's this indirect relationship, which is probably even more influential on our blood sugar, which is estrogen is needed to make serotonin. It's, it's, it's involved in the process of making it serotonin. Many of you know this already, which is it's seen as this antidepressant neurotransmitter hormone. You know, you hear that's what an antidepressant is. It's a serotonin reuptake hormone. So without the estrogen, women will find that they get depressed, that they get emotional. What do we do when we're depressed and we're emotional? 
what do we want to eat the grass fed steak and the broccoli? No, <laughs> we don't. We want sugar. We want to soothe these high emotions that we're feeling. Progesterone tank, which is, like I said, much earlier on. So this is from 35 on, or we start to lose our progesterone. Progesterone is really important to calm our brain down. It reacts on what's called your GABA receptors in your brain, which is very anti-anxiety. So women will suddenly go, why am I getting so much anxiety, especially in the second half of my cycle? And they're like, my PMS is so bad. I'm just, I'm just riddled with anxiety. I can't sleep, which we all know when we can't sleep, we become insulin resistant the next day. So with that anxiety, once again, how are we soothing ourselves? We don't, in that second half of our cycle, when you've got raging PMS, are you saying no to the chocolate? Are you saying no? I, pff, not me, <laughs> like not if I don't have it under control. So it's in this indirect way with anxiety and depression and not being able to tolerate life. It's like your nervous system just gets shut because you have no, this, none of this nice buffering progesterone and estrogen on board. Our cortisol tends to get high and then it tends to crash. So when it crashes, it's just as bad as when it's high. Now we're tired and we can't get off the floor. What do we want? We want quick energy. We don't want to go and eat healthy in a low carb diet when we're exhausted all the time and feeling burned out and fragile and our nervous system can't handle anything. We don't want to eat healthy when we feel like that, nor does your body, your body starts to send all these signals of quick, go get me a quick fix, go get my sugar fix, because this is what lights up my brain and makes me feel momentarily better, happier, calmer, less emotional. And maybe it's momentarily, momentarily, but it still, it drives us to do that. It doesn't drive us to go write in our journal about our feelings. It doesn't go drive us to check our blood sugar and see where it's at. We're not going to go check our hormones. It's that like instantaneous, I need something now to make me feel better. And what is the fastest way that that's going to happen is going to go into that cupboard and get whatever you can for that quick fix. So it's a vicious, horrible, vicious circle. Um, and you know, I talk about this lots on my own podcast and in this, my programs, the importance of watching your hormones as you age and getting on top of it because you don't want to wait till you're this hot mess. You're, you know, 48 years old. You've got no estrogen, you've got no progesterone, you're insulin resistant, your cortisol's tanked. And then you're like, now I'm going to try and get some help, which of course you should, and it's never too late. But the earlier you can start managing these things, the easier it's going to be as you go through this transition in your life into menopause. And it can be this amazing experience if you are on top of this and now you're educated and okay, this is what's happening. I'm having this really bad PMS probably because I'm not producing progesterone. Okay. What can I do about this? And you can get on top of it before it gets out of control. So those are the indirect, direct ways that, you know, we can be craving sugar and addicted to sugar, um, because of the hormones. Yeah. Wow. I just have so to say, I'm so grateful to have you as my friend. <laughs> like, I'm so grateful that I'm carrying my pocket. I'm turning 35 in a few weeks. So shit's going to hit 30. the fan <laughs> for me and Watch out. I'm coming to you. <laughs> oh my gosh. I remember when I was 35, I'm going to be 37 in a few weeks and I was 35 and she was telling me, she's like, yeah, perimenopause starts at 35. I'm like, I'm 35. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's the first time I'm hearing this, you know, like we don't know, we don't know this stuff about our hormones. And as you know, cisgender women, we have this extra complication when we start to go into perimenopause. It's like, we think we have everything all figured out. Like I'm all good and fine now, but you know, things are going to start changing. And, um, I like that you say, if you don't replace your hormones, then you're very likely to have these issues. And, um, I know we can, I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole, but I think some people might be surprised to hear that saying when maybe they've heard mixed things about hormones. I have, have you on my podcast talking about that, but yeah. um, I think that's interesting and, and exciting that perhaps with the right support that we can mitigate a lot of these symptoms and, and do well. 
Yeah. And I think too, like a lot of women, they blame themselves. I can't tell you how many times women come to me and they're beating themselves up because they can't control the sugar addiction that suddenly has popped up on them. You know, that they were fine their whole life, never had these kind of problems. Suddenly they're gaining weight and they're finding they're eating so much more and they're craving so much more sugar. And they're like, oh, this is, this is all my fault. And I shouldn't, you know, I just need to resist. I need to work out harder and diet harder. And it's like, Mm -hmm. but what if you just fixed your heart? What if you just gave back what your body needs and said, okay, how about we just give you a little bit of bioidentical progesterone cream in the second half of that cycle. And now suddenly it's like the cloud lifts and they're going, oh my gosh, I feel so much calmer. I'm sleeping so much better, which helps me with my sugar cravings. I'm just, I feel good. I'm not, I don't have anxiety anymore. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're going, instead of like battling it out, sometimes it can honestly be that quick of a fix is just simply giving back the body, the hormones that it's missing to help with your body's processing of the sugar. That's so powerful. And that reminds me so much of how so many people try to get off sugar by just trying to just take sugar and carbs out of their life, but they're not setting up, let's say their plate, they're not balancing out their macronutrients. So they're, they, what they tend to do is if we look at the macronutrients of carbs, fats, proteins, I also like to put fiber in that category because the, that broccoli in our you know, example is the fiber. So a lot of people will go, okay, fiber doesn't have an impact on your blood sugar. It slows the absorption of the sugar. So when we have just protein, let's say like a chicken breast, and then we have broccoli, that's protein and fiber, but we're missing the two fuel sources. I'm very visual. So that's why I'm doing this. Um, but we're missing the two fuel sources. We're missing either carbs or fat or a little bit of both. So people will take out all the fats and all the carbs because we're, we were taught we've lived through the eighties and nineties and we're like, okay, you know, fat's not good. And so we just have the protein and fiber and we have no energy. And then we say, how come I can't do this? How come this isn't sustainable? When, if we just add some fat, we, you know, load up on the fiber, the protein, the healthy fats, and then a reasonable or personalized amount of whole food carbohydrates, all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even need to have that whole sweet potato at the end of my meal. I just had two bites and I was fine. Like usually I, I need that. And meanwhile, I'm going to lunch and I'm, I'm not even craving. This feels like it doesn't even feel like me. And you like, I I'm telling you, I was the person I was hangry. I was a breakfast person. I was a snacker, like all these things I identified with that felt like permanent fixtures of my personality were actually just due to my blood sugar. So it's amazing that when you just hit the nail on the head and give the body what it needs, it just like clicks into place and it feels effortless. So if you are white knuckling something, it's a really big sign that your body is missing something. So if you're white knuckling, trying not to do this, maybe it's because you're, you know, you have this deep trauma from your childhood. Maybe it's because your plate is imbalanced and your, your body is screaming out for healthy fats, or maybe because your progesterone's dropping because you're going through menopause and you, or perimenopause and you don't know it. So either way, once you really get the body fueled the way it needs to be, or identify these, these triggers, it just becomes easier. And that's what I feel like the transformation we help a lot of our clients, we see this ease and all of a sudden there's like a flow to it. And they're like, it's never been this easy. And it's not always easy. There's challenges, but it shouldn't be this like giving it all you got, like white knuckling to the bone. So, or just falling off the wagon over and over Over and and you keep trying the same thing, like looking to a supplement or to a diet, the next best diet. And you keep doing this over and over, but yet you keep failing over and over. Then it's like big red flashing sign going, this isn't, you know, this isn't working. What you're doing is not working. So do something else. Look into what else could be the root cause because it's not that you're not doing keto or intermittent fasting or whatever the, the fad diet is at the time. So I, I think love that that, that yeah. um, definition of insanity, right? It's like doing yes. the same thing yes. over and over again, except expecting different results. Yes. Right. And that's totally what we're all doing, ladies, right? It's like, yeah. oh, I'll try this, this supplement or this, di-. like it's the same pattern over and over again. And it's just not working because we're just skirting around like the surface level of, of things, right? So yeah, enough of that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, let's get to some of these questions because I know we have a lot to say yeah. about these, some of these. So um, starting with, well, let's go with the supplements, uh, which is what are your fave supplements to help with insulin resistance? I would say Danny H, what's your yeah. <laughs> So um, honestly, for if when it comes to insulin and blood sugar, there's nothing more powerful than diet and lifestyle changes. It's almost for, I give my clients, I recommend quite a few supplements for them, but usually not in the area of, um, of insulin resistance. Funny enough. Um, oftentimes we do need to replace certain nutrients that are missing. So things like B vitamins, certain minerals like chromium, um, biotin is really important, which is a B vitamin and magnesium is a really, really important mineral. Oftentimes we need, uh, electrolytes for our adrenal glands that can really give people a lot of energy, but I look to replete the body of what it's potentially missing and then try to support the body's digestive processes. So we can break down our food better and absorb more food, reduce the inflammation, especially supporting our fat digestion. So we can actually digest and absorb these healthy fats that help us feel full and stabilize our blood sugar. And then we're not getting these really big spikes. People find that they can go longer between meals. Um, I do use berberine and sometimes inositol, but I have to say, I haven't really seen much. I can't say whether or not I've seen a difference. Um, I do like NAC as a liver support. I love grass-fed liver for supporting the liver. And then I love things like apple cider vinegar because that actually helps to reduce the blood sugar spikes of meals. I like walking after meals. So I like a lot of, like I said, these lifestyle things over, um, over a supplement, but there's not really a supplement that's going to, I mean, berberine, yes, has been shown to be as effective as metformin. I like the dihydroberberine, which is the active form a little better, but I'm not super into like all the, like, I guess like ALA and, you know, some other things they are just, I, I don't really use those in my practice and my clients get really good results from doing the diet and lifestyle stuff. And then specifically focusing on those potentially missing nutrients. Yeah. I, I personally, wanna, oh yeah, go ahead. Dan. Yeah. Sorry. I just wanted to, to touch on that. Cause I like, yeah, I love all those Danny. And I just want to point out something. So everybody could maybe be aware of maybe you're doing this right again. I'm always on the lookout for our band-aid approach. Right. And I know a lot of people are searching, like even that question is like, what's the supplement that I can use. That's going to solve all my problems. Right. Or what's the, you know, that's going to kick my sugar cravings. Like I know there's so much out there being done, like, you know, women just reaching for these, sugar craving supplements to hopefully solve all their problems. And again, that's a band-aid approach, you know, not, not what you're saying, Danny. I mean, obviously there is some important supplements that we need to make sure our body is having what it, what it needs to regulate properly. But most women, I just want to make sure for all of you to check in with yourself, you know, are you actually doing the real work and supplementing, or are you hoping the supplements are going to solve all your problems? Yeah, yeah, I agree completely. I do uh, find supplement this. Yeah, exactly. Same with the yeah, the hormone stuff. You can't out supplement it, but I do think that some supplements can certainly help. Absolutely, and just help with the cravings. Which you know, when people are really addicted, it can be super you know helpful. It's very helpful if oh, you have awesome. a little bit of like an edge off, you know, so you can help control your cravings. There's great medication as well as that you can talk to your doctor about, but there's also some good supplements like that Danny talked about. I do like berberine. I find when I personally take berberine, it just kills my sugar cravings, like to the point that it's boring, like life is boring. I'm like, I want to eat some sugar sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> That's how well it works for me. I like and, L-glutamine. Yeah, exactly I like L-glutamine <laughs> too. One of our, one of our guests mm. are saying L-glutamine. Yeah. L-glutamine works great. I've heard you can put like a teaspoon in your mouth and just let it sit there and it'll get rid of your sugar cravings. i mix it in water and it does the same thing. Yeah, so <laughs> you don't have to choke on the powder. Yeah, <laughs> so instead of like hold it under your tongue, I remember hearing that. Um, I also like ashwagandha sensorial mm -hmm. ashwagandha, very specific type. Mm -hmm. Um, I find that when I take that, because my stress really drives my sugar cravings, that that really can help lower my stress. And then I find I don't crave as much sugar. So those are two of my favorite and also inositol. Mm -hmm. I really like inositol for, um, my PCOS ladies. I think that that works very, very well. So those would be my favorite, but yeah, you guys go ahead, ask the next question, somebody. <laughs> 
Um, Karen, um, oh, actually, sorry, that one's for Danny D. Where does a person begin if they want to explore whether or not their sugar addiction has this emotional root cause? So, or did we ask this? We went into that. Yeah, I know. Okay, we're, we we've got that, a sheet, yeah. everybody, where we're okay. like trying to track and go through all these questions. So, so right now we're down where it says Q and A, ladies, and then yeah, we're, we're in the Q and A. Oh, we're in the Q and A. We just did we the first that. one, and okay. so the next one. Yeah, I can ask the next one. Um, okay, sure. So. Yeah. Someone's asking, I know I shouldn't be eating junk, but it keeps sneaking back into my life. So where do I even start? Um, yeah. I feel like I'd love to weigh in on this one first. I think um, go ahead. It's yours. Weigh in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I have tips too. So much, so much. So yeah, this is, this is where I really feel strongly. Like there's some bigger pieces under the surface going on here, non-physical. So emotional or energetic, that's really the sense that I'm getting from your question. Um, oftentimes, obviously, you know, Danny and Karen will weigh in around like, you know, blood sugar reasons that, I mean, and I think we've touched on a lot of that already, but what I really see is again, this emotional component. So knowing that we should be doing better, right? Like knowing what's good for us, but then, but then letting it sneak back in, there's usually some sort of, um, some sort of deeper root reason that we're either self-sabotaging ourselves because we don't believe we're worthy or because of uh, just it's become such an emotional crutch and we don't even know how to get through hard days without sugar, right? We just don't have those skills. So, I mean, there's so many follow-up questions that I would ask to this person who asked this question, but I would say the first place to start is, like I said earlier, just start getting curious about every time that junk food starts sneaking back into your life, start getting curious about what's going on in that moment for you. You know, what's, what's going on in your body? What emotions are present? Are you feeling rushed? Are you feeling um, kind of disconnected out of sorts? Or like the question I always love to ask my clients and all of you is what am I actually craving here? So that's a really, really simple yet profound question. If you start getting in the habit of asking, what am I really craving? You're going to start really getting some beautiful answers and, and very eye-opening answers as well. And that'll help you really notice, is there something, you know, deeper emotionally, energetically going on here, or maybe it's something like that Danny and Karen can, can talk to. It might be more of a physical thing as well. Yeah. So for the physiology piece, I would say to definitely try a continuous glucose monitor that has been by far my favorite tool for helping you to get in touch with what your symptoms are and what your blood sugar is doing and having that sort of accountability for me, obviously I think that the, the emotional and deep work needs to be hand in hand because this is not sort of coming from like a, a punishing or a guilting perspective, but I like to talk to my clients and my students about coming at this with curiosity, like, Oh, like I'm feeling anxious. I wonder let me check in on my glucose. And maybe I see there was a big spike or maybe I see it's fine. It's like, oh, maybe it's something else. So then we can get curious about what is the cause? Is it a physiological thing or is it a, an emotional thing that's sort of coming up? And then we just getting more in tune with your body is just probably the most powerful. And then I really can't state enough how important it is to have community around this and accountability. We are so much more likely to stick with something when we are part of a community. And that's why we all have the programs that we do and the membership options that we do, because we see that, you know, I have people who take my program and they don't choose to sign up for the membership. And then a couple of months later, once in a while, I get an email like, oh, I fell off and all these things. And I know this. And it's like, but when we're all here, we're focused on a goal. And when this becomes our lifestyle, it's so much different. And then, you know, I'm able to, I'm able to sort of work with you and say, you know what, maybe you do need to see Danny D. Maybe this is an emotional thing that's coming out. And so we're able to guide you and point you in the right direction, or maybe it's, maybe you're starting perimenopause, right? So there's so many things that can happen. And so working with a coach or someone who you resonate with and joining in a community of people, because what sometimes I ask my clients to do is very much against the grain of what 
everyone else is doing and everyone in your life. So you might feel isolated being the person who's not eating the bread when it comes on the table at the restaurant. People might ask you, why aren't you doing that? You know, like it can feel weird when you have to say no or be like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't eat that. Or I'm bringing my own dish or something like that. And when we make these new boundaries, a lot of, a lot of times, like our decisions will bring up other people's SHIT. And so they might project onto us. So we have these forces working sometimes against us. And when we feel like, oh, I'm not the only one doing this. This person also has this struggle. There's just something so validating about that. And it gives you this new sense of identity and this deeper sort of reinforcement of your why. And you're like, I don't need to look at other people. Like I'm not being crazy or whatever. It's just, it's really, really helpful to be part of a community. Okay. And I'll just say something very quick in response to it. Or else if we take this much time on every question, we're going to be here for three more hours. Um, <laughs> so when, what I hear is I, sh- I know I shouldn't be eating junk, but it keeps sneaking back into my life. So first of all, as soon as you say shouldn't to yourself, you're going to want it. Number one. So change that in your head. It also sounds like you're doing the all or nothing. Like that's it. No more sugar. It's out. I'm, I know I shouldn't be eating this. I'm not going to buy junk food anymore. And then it's sneaking back into your life. And next thing you know, you're binging on a bunch of sugar. So if you can be somebody that can handle 80, 20, then I would look into that instead of the all or nothing attitude, rather, you know, what the way I approach it is breakfast, lunch, dinner, like 80% of my food that goes in my mouth is my perfect diet for me to maintain my health. The 20% is left for the times like I'm going to go for dinner and I'm just not going to give a crap. You know, I'm going to get what I want, whatever, you know, it's like there's dessert. I'm going to eat dessert guilt-free. I never beat myself up for it. It's there because I have this nice 20%. And I know that majority of my life I eat really well. And so I don't have this like, oh, I shouldn't, but I'm going to. And, oh, it's the weekend. I better, oh, that stuff just messes with you and it doesn't work. You just roll with it and be, you know, 80%. So I'm going to eat, you know, I know I'm going to eat well and I'm going to eat healthy and it's going to taste great. And then the rest is for when I absolutely have to have Hagen does ice cream and there's no, no one's going to stop me from eating it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Which the next one I love, I love this question. Common advice I hear is listen to your body. How can I know if I can't trust what my body is telling me? You know, there's that whole intuitive eating. That's what it remind that question reminds me of the movement of intuitive eating, which everyone's like, if I listen to my intuition, I would eat sugar from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed. So how does that work? Right. And I really do think that you have to put, you have to implement a lot of what we're talking about here today and to be to be able to tune into your body and start listening to it, that you have to stabilize your blood sugar because if not, your blood sugar is going to be like, go and eat the sugar. So if you listened, it wouldn't be, t- wouldn't be telling you a good thing. Right. Sorry. It takes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I say, exactly. this. oh, sorry, Dan, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say exactly that, right? Like we have to first get the physical pieces under control so that we know. And I, as you were actually reading that question, Karen, I was thinking maybe we need to start actually advocating for the, like listening to your higher self. So it's not necessarily listening to your, yes, your right, right. Uh, dysregulated blood sugar and your physical pieces, <laughs> especially if you're, you're on the road and you're maybe not there yet. Right. In terms of having that all, um, regulated. So maybe it's like learning how to actually tune into your, your true intuition, right. Cause our intuition isn't, isn't, I need sugar, right. Like our, our, our intuition in my definition is, is our messaging system from our higher self. So like our higher self never wants us to do things that are going to totally um, destroy us, right? And, and ruin our health, right? For, for the most part, there is also the shadow side and the dark stuff too. But, um, you know, so if we can really tune in to those pieces and, 
You know, I also just want to mention here too, this word around trust. This has actually been something that I've very personally been working on for years now is this whole concept of trust. And the truth is most of us have been letting ourselves down and being out of integrity with ourselves our whole lives. And we've gotten to this place where we are so uh, distrusting of ourselves, of our inner voice, of our bodies, of our ability and our power to heal ourselves. Like we just don't trust anything. And we've put all of our trust in experts, in people with white lab coats and the food industry and doctors and the governments and like all this, this trust dynamic that we have is really, really toxic. And a big piece of the inner work that I do with my clients is about rebuilding that sense of trust within yourself and a relationship with yourself, right? Really understanding who truly am I and what is my truth? What are my desires? What am I here on the planet to do? And how can I start really listening to what my body's telling me, what my higher self is telling me? And over time, I have one of my best friends always, always pounds this into me that trust is built through consistency over time. So you think about building trust in a relationship, right? It's the same with this relationship with yourself and your body. So getting your, you know, obviously the physical components that both Danny and Karen are talking about under control is mandatory. Um, you have to have those under control or yes, you're always just going to be, well, my intuition says I want ice cream, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> that must be true. <laughs> So we have to, you know, it's obviously a, a complicated topic, but it's, it's really, it's really important and really powerful if we want to, um, yeah, li like Linda's saying, be kind to yourself and, and really have this compassion and, and, you know, really deeply learn to love and trust yourself again. I love that. And just to sum up for the physiological part, if I always say, if your blood sugar is dysregulated, going up and down or if you are eating, if you're currently eating ultra processed foods, then you will not be able to trust the messages of your body because they will be yeah. either driven by a, uh, like an addiction because of the food companies in there. Once you pop, you can't stop. That is literally, they have people in there designing the food to be like this. And then the blood sugar swings will also drive you to have that same issue. So once that's regulated, then you can start trusting yourself and, uh, barring this, uh, emotional piece as well. <laughs> so, uh, the next one is how does one best manage their hormones when heading to the perimenopausal state as it relates to blood sugar regulation, Karen? Um, I think doing a lot of the tracking, like doing testing, I think is really, really important. So whether that's with your CGM or you go to your doctor and you get the fasting insulin, the hemoglobin A1C and the fasting glucose done so that you can see if it's starting to become dysregulated, because like Danny said, it happens really early on before your doctor will say anything to you. I had a client once that was 0.1 marker away from being type two diabetic. And her doctor said she was fine. Point one. So that's ridiculous. So number one, really paying attention to the numbers, right? Look at the numbers. So, you know, if there is a problem, um, and of course, staying on top of the hormones as you're aging, because every woman's different. Some women will lose progesterone really early on. Other women, they'll lose their estrogen and progesterone really early on, and they can go into an early menopause, cortisol levels can be affected and be driving that sugar stuff. So watching and testing those as well, very, very important. And then there's things that you can do to help your body to produce hormones when you're in perimenopause. So there's things like Vitex that can help with progesterone levels. There's phytoestrogen. So there's a lot of natural, like the herbals, vitamins, minerals that can really help support hormone production so that they don't get so crazy. And then as you start aging, you can't supplement your way out of horm hormonal loss because it's just going to happen to every single one of us, no matter what, we are going to lose these hormones because we lose ovarian function, which at that point, then you can explore replacing those hormones and not waiting. As I said before, don't wait till you're this hot mess, 20 pounds overweight with no estrogen and no period. And now you're in menopause. So now you're going to go get the help or now you're going to go get hormones. It's not the way to approach it. You want to get on top of it as soon as possible. So working, of course, with a good hormone provider doesn't have to be me, <laughs> just just somebody that understands hormones and can stay on top of it. And it's all about how you're feeling, right? So if you feel like, oh, geez, I don't feel well like I used to, 
and maybe your progesterone is not rock bottom, but yet you're having severe PMS and anxiety and not being able to control sugar, then you could be a good candidate for progesterone. So it's all very individual, but those are, that's where I would start. And then of course, managing stress. That's the best thing that you can do to really sail through perimenopause and also regulate the blood sugar stress management. It's huge. That's great. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the next one. Um, so I'm, I'm terrified of feeling my emotions and I don't even know where to start. How do I even navigate the emotional work without falling apart? Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and weigh in on this one. Cause this is, this is really a, a big piece of the work that I do is really understanding that many of you listening to this, uh, probably have some sort of belief around really, uh, not fully leaning in. I'd be curious to talk more with you, Karen, because you're saying too, that you don't really fully lean into the, the big swings and emo- or those, those really powerful emotions, right. On, on, on the up and the down. Um, but there's this belief that if I fully allow myself to feel, you know, feel all the sadness, feel all the grief, especially when it comes to the heavier emotions, um, that I'm going to fall apart and I'm never going to be able to function in society again. Like there's this very big real fear. So I, I appreciate that question and just want all of you to know that this isn't an all or nothing kind of journey when it comes to really opening up to feel your emotions again, you can start really small and it's actually really important to go slow and to titrate, you know, in and out of emotions. But I'd say the most important piece to consider as you're starting to tune in two things actually is to prioritize actually spending time in stillness and in silence. So this is the best way to actually tune in with our true selves and to begin opening up space for our nervous system, for our psyches, for our body to really send us messages to also help uh, allow us to feel we, we can't feel when we're busy all day long. We just, we just can't. Um, and most of us are go, 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 going and just ignoring all of this. And that was, that was totally me as well. It was just so easy to ignore all the emotions and take a deep breath, suck it up and get on with the day and get all the things done that I needed to, and then crash in bed at night. So just know that like creating a little bit of space, even just 10 minutes in the morning, it doesn't have to be a formal meditation, but just to sit with yourself and go inward, close your eyes, go inward and just see what comes up. Um, another big, great place to start is journaling for those who, who do enjoy journaling practice. And then, and then like, I think Danny said earlier, um, big, big, big piece is the community and having the support and in that the safe space. So this is the piece that I could do a whole podcast episode on, but creating safe space is, is one of the things that's a priority in my groups. And really what happens there is we get to uh, really drop into a feeling of it's safe to express my emotions and be vulnerable and cry and be angry. And we can learn how to do that together when we're in a safe community and a safe space. So that's really important because I think a lot of, a lot of women out there are so terrified to feel because we have a lifetime of showing our emotions and actually being hurt for it. You know, someone look talking down to us because we're crying or calling us weak because we're crying or you're too sensitive, right? And all of this really toxic messaging that we have in our society around showing emotions. So, you know, really being, it's okay to be picky and with who you share your emotions with, especially in the beginning as you're, as you're learning to become more comfortable with those in your body. So yeah, good. Great. So well said. Yep. Okay. Right. Danny H is eating whole foods, dried or fresh going to cause insulin resistance the same way that sugar or sweets or breads, et cetera, will also, what would the best options be when someone wants a little something sweet? We have a couple of questions like that. So, yeah. So, um, I think it says whole fruits, so dried or fresh. So oh, talking sorry, about yeah. Yeah. Talking about fruits, it's really important when we think about this, we didn't really talk too much about foods in general, but when we talk about carbohydrates as a whole, the best carbohydrates for you are going to be the ones that are whole and unprocessed. So basically how they grew out of the ground. So a potato is going to be better on your blood sugar than potato chips. Rice is better than rice cakes. Mango is better than dried mango. Apple is better than apple juice. And like compared gram for gram of carbs, if you have like 10 grams of carbs of apple versus the apple juice, um, 
the apple juice will spike you more. So anytime you are doing some sort of processing to a carbohydrate, it will spike your blood sugar more. So it is going to be worse for insulin resistance. Um, so is the, the same way that sugar or sweets or breads. So yeah, um, this is one of the misconceptions I had when I was eating a paleo diet, which helped me heal my allergies and asthma and chronic sinus infections. It helped me heal so many things about my health, but I thought that because it was a whole food, it was healthy. It was a healthy carb. So it was coconut sugar or maple syrup instead of like white sugar. It was a plantain instead of potato chips. It was, um, you know, a sweet potato instead of bread. I was like, oh, I'm in the clear because these are healthy carbs. And I didn't realize that they still spike your, they can really spike your blood sugar a lot. So even if we're talking about the whole mango or a banana or a sweet potato or a plantain or rice or quinoa, these foods or oats or oat milk, these foods cause a very big spike of our blood glucose. And this is again, you know, my plug for continuous glucose monitors, because we want to see which foods spike us the most, because some people might do better with fruits versus grains or something like that. And we also want to see what quantity works for us. And this is not anything that any influencer or anyone on Instagram or on a podcast can tell you. This is really about your whole, your body and learning your body. So perhaps if you do a quarter of a sweet potato, you are doing your golden, but if you do a half a sweet potato, you get a giant spike and then you feel a crash and then you feel cravings. Maybe a regular potato actually works better for you than the sweet potato. Uh, so this is where that bio-individuality comes in. And so the best options for when some someone wants something sweet is to think about having a whole food carbohydrate, but eating it after a meal. So, you know, some dark chocolate. I love dark chocolate uh, uh, covered strawberries, berries are very low glycemic. So some sort of a fruit or something like that and eating it at the end of a meal where you've had proteins, fats, and fiber to slow the absorption. That would be the best time to have it also, um, after a workout or before a workout. And then, um, again, if we're talking about menstrual cycles, having it towards the end of your menstrual cycle. So right before your period starts, that's when we tend to want more carbohydrates anyway, but we need some of those carbohydrates to make progesterone. If I just don't want to speak out of turn if that's right. <laughs> not to make progesterone. No, <laughs> no, not to make no, it. Okay. No, to make serotonin. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And our serotonin drops because our estrogen drops in the second half of the cycle. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I stand corrected. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Um, well, that kind of answers Angie's question. Angie had asked too, like, what's the safe amount of sugar that I can eat? Um, so I think that that answers that she did I can also... kind of speak tiny yeah. a bit to that. Sure. So what you want to do is you want to, some people really need to go into ketosis at first to not at first, but they need to go into ketosis to become able to burn fat for fuel. And then the way that I work with a lot of my clients is flexing or cycling out of that. So we don't need to stay there. I don't recommend staying there for people. And I really want that to be. Uh, highlighted here. I don't recommend long-term ketosis for the very vast majority of people. And so figuring out how many carbs you can have would be, you want to find out how much of a carbohydrate doesn't spike your blood sugar, but leaves you feeling satiated and sort of full to the next meal. So add in enough where it doesn't trigger cravings, where it doesn't trigger a crash and all those symptoms, but where you're like, oh, I had just enough and my blood sugar only went up we didn't talk about how much it should go up after a meal, but typically about, we don't want it to go up more than 30 points or 1.6 millimoles at the end after a meal. So if we can keep it sort of under that 30, where we're just getting like a slight glucose curve, and then we're feeling really good after, and we're feeling energized and we're feeling satiated, that's the amount for you. So it's going to change all the time. So there's no exact specific amount of grams and work with the different kinds of foods. Because for me, if I have great Grains, I'm craving chocolate. If I do fruits, I'm doing really well. Fruits and fruits and roots, personally, I do best with. So figuring out which types of food work best. Yeah. And that's going to, I mean, Karen, this is probably uh, to hand over to you, but that also is going to change every week of our cycle. 
Yes. Right. Like mm-hmm. is like what we can handle and, uh, you know, how many grams our body can, can manage with and work with is going, and this is where it like, no wonder we're all confused. Right. And, <laughs> and really a lot of the research out there is not actually taking to account our beautiful, amazing cycle as women every month. And, and really how do we work within that to honor, okay, this week I might be able to handle more carbs this week. I need to have none. Right. I don't know if you have any pieces to add to that, Karen, but that seems like your area of expertise. (laughs) Yeah. I won't get into it too much, but it's, you know, our first half of our cycle, we're far more insulin sensitive. So that's where we are producing the most of our estrogen throughout our cycle. And so it's easier to eat lower carb in the first half of the cycle. It's easier to fast. So a lot of women, that's when that's the two weeks where they're going to choose to maybe clean up their diet a little bit and not give into the cravings because it's easier. And then the second half of the cycle, when progesterone comes in or not, depending on how old you are, (laughs) then, you know, it can, like I said before, then we got that indirect feelings of maybe some anxiety, not sleeping as well that are driving those sugar cravings. And then also we're not producing as much estrogen serotonin drops. How do we, how can we make serotonin through carbohydrates and tryptophan? So we, your body's going, "Mm, I want some of that. And so, yeah, listening to that, I think is a good idea. And I've always said, like, I like to save it save my treats for the second half of my cycle, because in the first half, I don't crave them. I do really easy, like so easy. I can work out harder. Second half, it's not as easy. I start to really crave sugar, especially around that, like 10 days before my period. It's just like, Ooh, so that's when I, I'm like, okay, this is it. This is the time I'm going to go get that Hagen does. And then it peters off by the time my period, my period gets here. So Yeah. Working with your cycle, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a question here that I want Danny D to answer because it's, um, she has recently jumped into psychedelics, (laughs) not psychedelics. Not recent. Not not, recent. Yeah. Not recent. No, but um, recently came out of the closet about your use of psychedelics or plant medicine. We'll call it plant medicine, but somebody said, how do I discover what's really at the root of my addiction to sugar? And I think we've talked a lot about all that today, but that's one piece that we didn't mention that I think can really be helpful at discovering the root. Yeah. A hundred percent. Oh my goodness. Okay. This is, this is a the huge, another topic. So we'll preface this by by really just letting everyone know to come listen to my podcast. I did like Karen say, I just came out publicly about my own personal healing and use of psychedelics um, on my podcast in December. So there's actually two episodes there, one with my personal psychedelic therapist and one with my husband as well, where we share our very in-depth personal journeys. Um, and it's been something that, you know, I, I got into that, we'll call it that world quotation marks. Um, about five years ago now, after years of hearing about it and learning about it, being in these spiritual communities, traveling, hearing people, you know, going to ayahuasca retreats or doing, you know, psilocybin ceremonies and different things. And uh, it took me forever to actually be ready to let go of my control issues and fear and, and really trust in that work. So I, I really like, this is a subject that is going to be coming more and more talked about. And I, I have to also say this before even sharing any more that this is an area that is very sacred and very important to not take lightly. So it's going, I'm already seeing it happen. This is kind of becoming a fad. People are talking about it. There's a lot of people out there navigating it in a really dangerous way in a re traumatizing way, in my opinion. So just be very cautious. This isn't for everyone. Um, there's a lot of things to consider. Please reach out to me if you have any questions about safety and considerations with that, because it's a very, it's something yeah, very important in my life and something that is, is coming into slowly and slowly into actually the work that I'm doing with my clients. So the, the small piece without spending hours talking about this is for anyone who hasn't heard um, about this, this, you know, psychedelics, there's so many, there's um, empathogens. So things like MDMA assisted therapy. Um, there's even a lot of uh, research and studies now being done with ketamine, uh, with psilocybin, obviously with ayahuasca, like there's, there's a lot of different types and they all have a different energy and healing modality. 
And we're now shifting into an era where we're understanding that these substances aren't drugs. This isn't a war on drugs. And it really comes down to our intention behind using them. So the healing capabilities here are absolutely profound. And I can speak very personally to a lot of that. Come listen to my podcast. Um, but when we use these psychedelic substances or these healing substances to to go in with the intention of healing. I want to go in and, and discover and heal traumas. I want to go in and learn about my self-sabotaging patterns and my addictions to, to sugar uh, or food or alcohol. Um, when we go in with that intention, what can happen, and obviously every medicine is very different, but in general, we get we get to calm down our ego mind and we get access to different parts of our inner wisdom and our subconscious brain um, where we can access memories and traumas and emotions and even access universal love and truth, right? There's, there's some, there's some, there's some definite travel that we can do with, with these substances that just really helps you build new understandings and new neuro pathways to, to really heal, you know, any of these root causes that might be driving you to, to really, you know, be reaching for sugar and, and any addictive patterns and any patterns, right. Relationship patterns, or, uh, I mean, the, the applications of healing is, are pretty profound and the research that's finally starting to actually be done, right. Or proving things like even microdosing small amounts, um, are, are a huge, huge help for depression, anxiety. Um, you know, it's, it's really, really been a profound healer for me and understanding, actually even uncovering and understanding my traumas and being able to go in in a one day session uh, with support and with the right person with me to actually navigate into those tricky traumas and, and heal them, get the, the love that I didn't get or get the validation that I didn't get and release the emotions that I needed to release. I mean, there's, there's so much, so I'm not going to keep going because there's, there's a lot to talk there, but I'm, yeah, I'm grateful for that question. This is a huge, um, huge asset. And it's something that we do need to take very seriously and be very cautious around as well. Cause there's just a lot, a lot as this is changing and a lot as this is surfacing and, and think certain substances starting to become legal and all of this, but, um, yeah, it's something that's very near and dear to my heart and, and supporting it's, it's pretty powerful healing. I often say it's in my experience, right. It's like one in one day, you can do like 10 years worth of therapy. Um, and not even like you get access to these parts of your brain that you would never in talk therapy. Right. And, and the wisdom of your body, like we we've been talking about. So yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. All right. Thank you for that. And I think that that's something that really needs more awareness. So, because it's a very powerful healing modality. So I've seen it change people's lives. Yeah. Especially in the world of addiction. I mean, it's really fascinating to see the studies doing, and I know like Gabor Mate is really involved in that and Dennis McKenna, and there's a lot of leaders here really, really proving the the incredible therapeutic benefits for um, yeah. most of these substances. Yep. Agreed. Okay. We got two more questions and then that's it ladies, unless there's more questions from our guests that are with us today. Uh, we've got an anonymous person that wrote in, she's 44, she's got blood sugar issues, it's always 100 and 115 in the mor morning, no matter what she's eaten, uh, she used a CGM a blood sh and, and blood sugar would spike to 120 to 130 at night, she's done all the supplements, she's, let's see, it's a very long, so I'm trying to just you know, cut through this a little bit. Thyroid labs, all normal, but many symptoms of hypothyroid, weight gain, fatigue, especially chicken or the egg here. Thyroid causing issues with blood sugar or blood sugar causing issues with thyroid. Remember, it goes back and forth or something else completely. Nothing seems to move the needle on either except, except thyroid speeding up if things move toward the hyper side of the range or just out, but not sure what made that happen in the first place. Losing hope and money, trying to stop this and heal since labs are in range. Western med doctors are useless. It's in my head, right? Ha ha. Um, holistic, holistic doctors have only helped me with parts of healing. Uh, no more mold or candida, but no one can solve the weight and exhaustion issues. I live a clean lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So she's doing so much right here. 
and still getting frustrated with her blood sugar. So my first, when I read this, my first thought was you likely have not had a proper look at your thyroid numbers. So because they're in range doesn't always mean that those are ideal ranges. A lot of people can have actually very normal thyroid ranges, but yet be hypothyroid. Um, it sounds like you may even have an autoimmune condition because you went hyperthyroid for a while. And then it sounds like you move back to hypo. And that's very common to go from Hashimoto's to Graves disease, hypo to hyper, very common. So get to, if you haven't already, thyroid peroxidase tested as well as thyroid globulin tested as well as reverse T3. So a thyroid can look great, free T3, free T4, awesome, TSH, awesome, but yet you have an elevated reverse T3, which is putting the brakes on your metabolism. The other thing I want you to do is take your basal body temperature and see where is your body temperature, because if you are consistently coming under 37 or 98.6, 98.2 to 98.6, consistently coming under that, then I would say you likely not 100%, but you likely could have a thyroid problem or an adrenal problem. So getting those two checked out, very, very important. But yes, first and foremost, I wonder if there is actually a thyroid problem. I know you've been told there isn't, but it really, really sounds like there is, especially because you went from hyper to hypo. So that's so that's interesting. Would, yeah. 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 And it, it does sound like, I think she thinks there is a thyroid problem. She's like, yes, <laughs> you know, 100%. just based on She's how like, she answered the question. This feels like it. Yeah. Yeah. And the exhaustion and all that. I would also just say, just put a little plug for looking at circadian rhythms, yep. you know, getting in a lot of people have done like tons of keto, tons of fasting, especially skipping breakfast. And this is driving up our cortisol and leptin levels. And this can also dysregulate hormones and usually leptin resistance, which I'm just starting to learn about. I don't know a ton about, but it goes hand in hand with insulin resistance and it can keep people holding on to weight. And so eating, you know, seeing the sunrise, eating breakfast within 30 to 60 minutes of waking. And, um, that can really help to start to reset some of this circadian stuff, which is all driven by hormones. So, um, you know, getting your feet on the earth and getting outside as much as possible. So some of those natural type strategies can probably only help. <laughs> yeah. And also she could, she doesn't even talk about getting her hormones checked. So what's your cortisol doing? Maybe you you could, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where's your testosterone? Maybe that's super high in driving the blood sugar problems or the blood sugar problems driving the testosterone problems. Yeah. So look at your hormones, just you're 44. You probably have low progesterone levels. You know, some women go into early menopause and start losing their hormones. So yeah, getting a bigger picture, I think is a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So oh. I'll oh, jump in and read the last one. Cause I have a feeling Danny, you're going to jump in here and, and like answer this. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is good. Uh, finally, the last but not least we're ending with the big, the big conversation. Um, so this uh, dog mom is asking, uh, my blood sugar is usually around 108 or 120 in the morning after waking up. I want to get it below hundred. I do not want diabetes. I know I have insulin resistance issues. I'm postmenopausal. I take excellent blood sugar supplements. And I exercise, I eat healthy and have been trying more plant-based eating always with lots of vegetables. Uh, I still eat meat once in a while. What's the best way to bring this number down in the morning and stay more balanced throughout the day. My father's a diabetic and I don't want to end up there. Thank you. So yeah, Danny, let's, let's get into this conversation. I know you're biting yeah. up a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. So the blood sugar ranges that this person is talking about is definitely in the pre-diabetic range. I'm not diagnosing you, but that's where those numbers are sitting. And I love that you're saying that you don't want to end up there uh, where your, your dad is. And I really just want to call out that just because someone in your family has diabetes does not mean that you will get it. Genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. So just because someone has it doesn't mean that you will get it. So your, she was saying that I take excellent blood sugar supplements and exercise. And as we said before, we can't out exercise, uh, sorry, out supplement this. So, um, you know, sometimes just taking things to lower our blood sugar is not really going to help. So the way I'd look at this is, you know, she's saying that she's been trying more plant-based eating. And in my experience, 
having more meat on your plate is going to be the most satiating and blood sugar stabilizing thing that you can eat. So I am very pro animal based uh, eating for stabilizing blood sugar. So we talked about those healthy proteins and fats that we can get from animal sources. Unfortunately, the protein sources from, from, uh, plants come with a lot of carbohydrates, like a legume. I look at that like a chickpea. Some people see it as having high protein. To me, I see it as a carb source. So if all of the proteins that you're getting are coming with extra carbs or the they're minimal, like from nuts, then where are these proteins coming from? Soy is going to dysregulate your hormones. Um, I'm not a big fan of soy, Karen. I don't know what you feel about it, but um, it's mostly GMO. It blocks your thyroid function. It's just a disaster for, for your hormones. And so if we don't have the meats, we're also probably going to be overeating because we protein is the most satiating macronutrient. So our body is going to seek protein and you're going to be hungry until you get enough. So you may be extra hungry and you're not getting the really, really important amino acids that you need that come with so many wonderful B vitamins and all sorts of nutrients that help to stabilize your blood sugar. So I would say swap the plant-based and go more animal-based and continue with the vegetables and see if that helps, uh, for, and, you know, obviously we'd need to take a way deeper look and look at stress levels and hormone levels and things like that. But just because she gave us this bit about her food, I'm just going to highlight that. Awesome. Yay. All right, ladies, we are out of time. Wow. Right at the nick of time, which is awesome. <laughs> Actually, that was great. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there's going to be so many questions that are going to come in after people listen to this, but we'll post it in Instagram. And so if you've got questions, then you can always comment below and we and one of us will answer you. So you can just tag us. And we're all act pretty active on Instagram, Danny H especially, but um, yeah. Maybe me too. Me too. Email me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, my friends, thank you so much for doing this roundtable with me. It's yeah. been a great pleasure. And I wish I could do this every single week with you guys because it's been so much fun. But uh, thank you for your knowledge and for your help. Um, and I'm sure that all the listeners are saying the same thing. Thank you so much. Should we share our podcast real quick? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Mine is Unlock the Sugar Shackles podcast. Oh, we shared it at the beginning. We did. Yeah. She's we plugging did. in again. Beyond we Sugar did. Freedom is my podcast. <laughs> and the other side of weight loss. So yeah. Awesome. You guys, yeah. thank you for hosting this, Karen. This was, thank you. Yeah, this was so much fun. And thanks right, everyone guys. for being here. Yes. Thanks everybody for showing up that did. It's been awesome. Thanks. thanks All right, everyone. ladies. Yeah. Till okay, next time. Bye.